Welcome to Truth Triumphant Radio. I'm your host, Cody Mori, and today I have a special guest, Pastor Bill Hughes again, uh, with Truth Triumphant Ministries, obviously, and we are going to be talking about, well, slavery, the issue of slavery. Most of us today, especially in the United States, but of course just abroad throughout the world right now, are just being bombarded with the ideas of racism. Recently in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, they're talking still to this day about, which was clearly a self-defense issue. They've made it a race issue. They've painted the picture of uh, Kyle Rittenhouse being some type of white supremacist, even though all the individuals involved in the case, both the quote-unquote victims and the, uh, well, who the prosecution calls the uh, the oppressor there, they were all white. Uh, so... So there's, there's an issue with race big time going on. So we wanted to talk about the actual issue of slavery and who is behind it. Now, there's no question that we have had, in the past, we've had players from all different sides of the spectrum. Protestants are involved as well as Catholics, but we want to go back to the origins. So Pastor Bill Hughes, can you tell us a little bit about slavery, specifically the slave trade, and the issue of slavery um, really dating back to the 1500s and beyond. Cody, the, um, the slave trade, I'd really like to start with why. Why slavery? Okay. Uh, of course it was an economic thing, uh, but it, it went so, for, so much deeper than that because there were powerful, and we, we read it in the book Great Controversy, there were powerful Christian Sabbath-keeping churches throughout Central Africa. And we read about that in Great Controversy, um, page 63 and 64. It says, in lands beyond the jurisdiction of Rome, there existed for many centuries bodies of Christians who remained almost wholly free from papal corruption. These Christians believed in the perpetuity of the law of God and observed the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Churches that held to this faith and practice existed in Central Africa and among the Armenians of Asia. So there were, as, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, there were Sabbath-keeping Christian churches that held fast to the faith of the Bible. This went on for centuries in Central Africa. <coughs> this is really lost history, too. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's completely lost history. It's like, it's like you were introduced in the Bible to the Ethiopian eunuch uh, in Acts chapter 8 verses 27 to 38. And then after that, it's like it, it's all focused on what's going on in, um, you know, uh, Egypt, north in Alexandria with the early church fathers, Tertullian, and then of course the great compromise with Constantine the rise of the papacy in the 6th century, and then the Dark Ages. But, but there was something going on of a, uh, a, a huge, a huge thing was going on in Central Africa all during this time because the truth of, of the Bible, uh, the truth of the Old Testament, uh, the truth of the Seventh-day Sabbath, that was spreading like lightning across Central Africa for centuries. So they weren't just these these jungle tribal uh, demon worshiping individuals. As many times the paint the the picture that were painted in the past and even up into this very day of what went on and is going on in Africa. The fact of the matter is there was a great deal of Bible believing. Christian Sabbath keepers, mm -hmm. and they were at odds with Rome in history. Absolutely, they were. For cent, this is <laughs> again, we're not looking at days, 
We're not looking at months. We're not looking at years. We're looking at centuries. And, and you know, you can put your own uh, tally on that. But with the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, you then have the because this man was a powerhouse in Ethiopia. He was right underneath the queen herself, Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Man had great influence, great power, great wealth. So he goes back to his homeland. He starts sharing the gospel of Christ and all that that entailed. And so you have these powerful, powerful Sabbath-keeping Christian churches that were hidden from Rome for centuries. But then the papacy comes in. They realize that here are some powerhouse <clears throat> Sabbath-keeping peoples who are rejecting Rome's authority. So what does Rome do? They say, we are going to stop this immediately. So what they did was they, they sent in, and at first they sent in their Portuguese, their Spanish, uh, and their French traders, these, these ships, trading ships. They'd go up and down the coasts of Africa to trade with the African peoples. Well, on every one of those ships, because the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the French they all espoused the Catholic faith. On all of these merchant ships, they all ha had Catholic priests on board. So when the merchants went ashore to sell with the African peoples, well, the priests went on shore to convert the African peoples. Well, the African peoples were not interested they weren't interested. And so what happened? Over time, the priests became very irate because they realized they couldn't trick or, or fake out these people. So what did they do? They brought in their guns. Because again, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the French were all Catholic. Yes, Catholic powerhouses. Absolutely. And at that time, mm. I, I, I just want to point out for the listeners, at that time... The Spanish Inquisition was going on. You also had uh, the Catholic, this is right on the heels of, uh, and right around the same time as St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France, mm -hmm. and the, the persecution and weeding out of the Protestants there. So these, are, these aren't just Catholic countries. These are, these are, they own it like a badge of honor. They are Catholic countries, and that's the religion they intend to spread. Absolutely, Cody. You know, here's, here's a statement that, that shows you uh, the dynamic that was going on in Europe and the, the influence of the papacy over the various European powers. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 11, page 455. It says, one of the first acts of Alexander VI, now this was Borgia, Victor Borgia, mm, okay. the licentious, wicked, immoral pope who was there when Martin Luther was beginning to take his, his vows as a monk and then beginning to learn the gospel from the Book of Romans. So this was the man in power. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, one of his first acts was to effect a settlement between Spain and Portugal. These two nations had been foremost in undertaking voyages of discovery in the East and West. The result was that as each expedition on landing annexed the newfound territories to its own home government, there was continual friction between the rival nations. Alexander VI offered to arbitrate between the two countries. Alexander divided the world and gave a part of it to Portugal and the rest to Spain. They did as they were told. So they div divided up the new world. They said, okay, the Spanish, you can take the, the northern part. The Portuguese, you take the southern part. And so that's what happened because Alexander said so. 
That's an interesting point. These two countries, they were subordinate to the Pope. Absolutely. Once the Pope said, you can have this and you can have that, that was it. The issue was settled. There was no uh, f forward issue mo moving on besides that. Their God had spoken, in other words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another statement about what was going on in Africa during the Dark Ages. Great Controversy, page 578. It says the churches of Africa held the Sabbath as it was held by the papal church before her complete apostasy. While they kept the seventh day in obedience to the commandment of God, they abstained from labor on the Sunday in conformity to the custom of the church. Upon obtaining supreme power, Rome had trampled upon the Sabbath of God to exalt her own. But the churches of Africa, hidden for nearly a thousand years, did not share in this apostasy. So, you know, over a thousand year period, you have ingrained in the churches of Central Africa to follow Christ and him alone and to honor the Seventh-day Sabbath. Well, when the papacy found out about it again, they come in, they, they bring their priests on all of the, uh, you know, merchant ships of the Portuguese and the Spanish and the French. When their entreaties fail, they bring in their guns. When the guns, okay, for a while they were okay, but after a time, they then figure out the only way we are going to destroy these mighty Sabbath-keeping churches in Africa is to destroy the families. And the way you destroy the family, you take the dad away, and you take the mother away, and you take the children into a different area, you enslave them. You destroy the family unit because, let's face it, a church is made up of families. You destroy the family, you destroy the church. If you destroy the family and the church, you destroy the nation. And that is exactly what Rome did as the Western Hemisphere was being divided up. They divided through the horrific institution that we call slavery. They destroyed these mighty Sabbath-keeping Christian churches in Africa. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that, that, that actually points us to ama an amazing truth that I, think, that I don't think that we should uh, uh, miss here. And that's Africa's glorious heritage. They have a glorious heritage. Their people are not brutes, as they are many times painted, both in modern and in uh, medieval times. But they they were Sabbath keeping, Bible believing, uh, protesting, in the true word of a true sense of a Protestant against Rome. So there's all this stuff about race really isn't about race. It's about religion, and it's about religion today as well. Everything that's being painted as race is it's a it's a pretense in order to either take civil liberties or rights away in some form or another. But the end state, the end goal is to attack true Bible believing Christianity, which would include the Sabbath, God's commandments and the belief in the state of the dead. These are just some of the things. Uh, but. Africa has a glorious heritage, one not written in the history books, one whom the history, Mrs. White tells us, is basically lost. But one day we'll know exactly what happened there. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's not just the, the great heritage, both uh, religiously, uh, politically, but we're, we're looking at, at the wealth uh, economically. Africa is just an incredibly wealthy continent. 
But even to this day, the resource is there. Absolutely. Right? The, the diamond mines of, of South Africa, the, uh, the other incredible uh, minerals that are, are buried deep beneath the African soil. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. And that has all been taken away from the African peoples uh, by the by the white European. I remember, I'll never forget it, uh, went on a mission trip to Kenya. As we were going uh, across central Kenya, I thought I was in Nebraska. The, the, the soil is so rich. It is so rich. And I asked the uh, Kenyans, I said, what, what's growing out there? And they said, uh, tea. I said, and how many, how many Kenyans are enriched by the, the uh, growing of tea? And they responded and said, not one African, not one Kenyan is enriched by the growing of tea. Uh, it's the white Europeans. And they grow the tea in Kenya and then sell it in London, Brussels, Prague, Vienna. It's sold in Europe. And not one Kenyan is enriched by that at all. So we see, as you said, Cody, to this day, the, the continual destruction of, of everything to try to subdue and to destroy the African peoples. Yes, and, and uh, I will say this too, and I've said this before on this show, um, there are three major players, and I'm speaking specifically about the United States when I say this, so two of them are global players. The, the third one will be a local player here in the United States. But historically, the three major groups that have been part of the, the biggest part of the, uh, sl both the slave trade in the United States and the slave trade abroad are, number one, the Roman Catholic Church during the what we call the Age of Exploration and really enslavement. I mean, you just look at what Cortez did with the Aztecs. You look at what DeSoto did in Florida. You look at, uh, you know, any one of these people that went, whether it's to Africa or people in the New World, uh, the Jesuits were always on those ships, and they were always enslaving these people. They were taking their money. They were taking their gold, and they were enriching their coffers with it, as well as the Catholic countries. The second major player is Islam. Islam throughout Africa, when the hordes were marauding through the area, they constantly take slaves and they are a major player in the slave trade even to this day. Hmm. There's 12 million slaves, 12 million black slaves in Africa right now, right now as we speak. And they are enslaved to Muslim warlords who have taken over the regions there. So what you have is you have Muslims in the past and in the present, they take over certain areas and individuals who do not share in the Muslim faith, whether they are Christians or Jews or some other religion, what they do is with those people is they either kill them um, or they'll enslave them because enslaving someone, you can make money off of them. This is why the uh, Islam was very much involved in uh, and piracy in the Mediterranean and even the United States fought against them in the Barbary Wars. Mm -hmm. Those are wars against Muslim pirates, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So those are two major groups. The third major group here locally in the United States was the Democratic Party. Now, I'm not saying that you should be pro-Republican. I'm just saying, historically, the Democratic Party in the United States was the pro-slavery to a fault pro-slavery party. It was Abraham Lincoln and the creation of the Republican Party back then. It's I wouldn't say it's a good thing now, uh, but back then that was one of their main stances was against the slave trade here in the United States. So those are your three major groups. So it shouldn't surprise us when we see Rome working with Democrats and Muslims 
It's just a historic uh, fit in the past, and uh, it shouldn't surprise us today. Hmm. You know, Cody, a statement here that I, I want to look at briefly is, you know, you were mentioning about how these, these Spanish Portuguese explorers, uh, when they came to the New World, in their, in their greed and in their lust for gold and wealth, they were just treating the, the natives, the native Indian populations uh, in Cuba, in Mexico, and, and other areas of Florida, treating them so horribly that the native population started dying off. To you know, tremendous amounts of natives were being eliminated because they couldn't handle the hardships that were being imposed upon them by these uh, the explorers from uh, Portugal and Spain primarily. So there there came about an absolute necessity for peoples to be brought to the new world who would then do these, these terrible jobs that the uh, explorers wanted to be done. And of course, the people that were uh, felt that they could do the job were the blacks of Africa. From Humboldt's book called The Island of Cuba, page 51, it says this, the disappearance of the indigenous races, those that were uh, natives to those areas, gave rise to a great social necessity in the new settlements. Send us at once, said the Spanish officers of Cuba in 1534 to the emperor, 7,000 Negroes that they become inured to labor before the Indians cease to exist. Otherwise, the inhabitants cannot sustain themselves. This social necessity gave birth to Negro slavery in America. Well, we already noticed the power of the papacy over these Spanish officials, over the Portuguese, that they would do whatever they were told. And as, as these explorers are demanding African slaves to be sent to the New World, we don't hear one word of protest from the Catholic Church. Not a single word. What Rome wanted was that gold and the wealth of the New World. And if that meant it, it was done over the whipping of, of black slaves, of African slaves, so be it. It's, it's a horrific, it is a horrific history as to how Romanism and Islam uh, and the white Europeans, how they mistreated. It, it's just a horrible, horrible history as to how the Africans were treated at the hands of these evil, evil men. It's also one thing I want to point out as well that you can see clearly, uh, especially in that quote, is the, uh, the strength and hardiness of the black African. Because they were where other races would die off, they would survive. And it, it really provokes the question in my mind, why were they stronger? Why were they able to endure more? Um, it makes me think, and I can't prove it, but it just makes me believe that a lot of these people were Christians. Mm -hmm. Because Christian, a Christian would be empowered by God to be able to endure uh, much more hardship than someone who didn't cast their self upon the strength of Christ. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but there is some reason, some reason we might not understand right now, that it was the black African and not the Native American um, in either in the islands or, or in uh, the Northern Hemisphere uh, that was able to endure the harsh, the horrible hardships 
that the white Europeans were placing upon them, but for some reason the Africans could. I would like to see that question answered one day, probably from Christ's own mouth. <laughs> you know, because of the fact, Cody, that there is so little, uh, so little information about what was going on in Africa for a thousand years during the Dark Age, the Dark Ages, uh, we can we can glean and we can surmise from those little snippets of information from the Great Controversy. You know, we're we're looking at at an incredibly rich heritage, a Christian heritage, uh, a Bible believing. Christian heritage that went on in Central Africa for a thousand years. We can we can glean from that the fact that that the faith of the African peoples was was very very strong. We can glean that, and so they pass that on to their children, their children's children. And again, this went on for centuries, so that it was so deeply embedded in these African peoples that when they were so horribly forced to be the subjects of white European slavery, that they, were, they took some of that rich heritage with them. I would think, Cody, that without that strong faith, I don't know how anyone mm. could have survived the 400 plus years of slavery in the New World. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. Right, because we have seen it at one point in history as well, which is, is, is beyond the days of Joseph and before the days of Moses the children of Israel were enslaved and they it said that they had harsh tax masters. Sure. Um, so we know that they were empowered by God. So it, it just makes me think that there was a, a power somewhere that was beyond human that was assisting uh, that, that race a, in surviving the things that they did where other races uh, who did not have a biblical worldview embedded back at home, at least somewhere, um, did not survive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you 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 have uh, some information I understand about uh, the Catholic view uh, in American history as well on on black folks on slaves. Um, can you share some of that information with us, Cody? In the 1840s, 1850s the senator from South Carolina, John C. Calhoun, was constantly trying to stir up America and was continually trying to split America in half over the issue of slavery. Uh, Calhoun, the uh, major political figure in South Carolina, was trying to do that repeatedly and this went on through the 1830s, 40s, 50s, till finally you couldn't do anything else. And with the election of Lincoln in 1860, that was the precursor to the inevitable Civil War. Just prior to the Civil War, there was a famous decision of a runaway slave. His name was Dred Scott. And Dred Scott fled from his tax masters to a free state. And uh, the Dred Scott decision of 1856 went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the decision that was made by the Supreme Court, in 1856, the Chief Justice at that time was a man named Roger Taney. He was a devout Roman Catholic, and in his deciding decision, Taney declared these words. 
He said, Negroes have no rights that the white man is bound to respect. The, the heinous, the diabolical, the it just makes me sick to read Tanny's decision. But Tanny's decision is simply the outflow of Catholic thought that he was raised on, uh, lived on throughout his entire life. This is what he was taught as a Romanist, and he simply was parroting what he had been taught as a Roman Catholic all his life. Um, you know, after the killing of Abraham Lincoln, when Mary Surratt, who it was in her home on 8th Street in Washington, D.C., Mary Surratt, a devout Roman Catholic woman, stated these words. This is quoted in Slavery and Catholicism, a tremendous book by Pastor Richard Miller on page 79 of the book. But this is what this diabolical, devilish Catholic woman in whose home where the plot for the assassination of Lincoln was hatched, she said this. She said, the death of Abraham Lincoln is no more than the death of any nigger in the army. So again, we, we see this woman who imbibed the teachings of Roman Catholicism, her hatred for, her, her absolute feeling that a black person was somehow inferior to a white person comes out so strongly in what she said about Abraham Lincoln. And the fact that these were the core principles that Mary Surratt was taught growing up in the Roman Catholic Church, that black people are to be given no rights and no respect. So this, this is a teaching that permeates the history of Romanism that we see so horribly made dreadfully clear in Tanny's decision at the Supreme Court in 1856, Mary Surratt's comments uh, shortly after Lincoln was shot by a Jesuit operative, John Wilkes Booth. Um, so we see Rome's feelings coming out very clearly in some of their adherents. It's also a fact of history that the only leader that actually supported Jefferson Davis the president of the Confederacy, the only leader in the world that acknowledged Davis as the president of a sovereign nation was Pope Pius XI. Wow. Uh, Pope Pius XI was the only leader in the war, in the world during the Civil War to acknowledge Jefferson Davis uh, of the Confederacy as a, a legitimate leader of a legitimate government. Pope Pius XI called Davis uh, the illustrious and honorable president of the Confederate States. You know, the, the attempts today to paint Roman Catholicism as the friend of African peoples is, is an absolute misnomer. It's an absolute lie that they are only perpetrating until they can cast the, the African peoples away and re reestablish 
slavery again. Uh, because Pope Pius, Mary Surratt, Roger Taney, and many, many others have made it very clear through history how Rome feels about the African people. They're the real racists, aren't they? Oh. And they dehumanize people. And it's, this is not the first time we're seeing Surratt, we're seeing uh, the Pope here, Supreme Court Justice Taney. Uh, we're seeing them dehumanize the black man, don't we? Absolutely. Uh, simul this is not the first time they've done this. No. They dehumanized true Christians and Jews during the Dark Ages as heretics, rats, scum of society. They, they did the same thing um, for Jews during World War II. They were the rats and scum of society. They dehumanized them, and then they slaughtered them. They dehumanize the black folks uh, in the past, and in the future, they still have the same view. They're using this people right now. They don't care about them. They don't love them. So when we see, when we see encyclicals like Fratelli Tutti uh, coming out, talking about one humanity and this and that, that's a load of garbage because totally. all of this hatred towards heretics, quote-unquote, towards Jews, towards, towards African slaves, towards different peoples, the Serbs. What's wrong with the Serbs? They're hated, aren't they? It's Absolutely. because they're historically Protestant. Absolutely. And that's what we got to understand is that Rome attacks and uses anybody they can, but especially their hatred, because it's the hatred of Satan himself. Um, is towards the true Christians. And I think we've somewhat made a case uh, for what happened in Africa that that is most likely the case as well. Uh, I don't think there's any question, Cody, because like you just brought up, uh, the Serbs, the, the whole issue with the Serbs had to do with their split with Rome in the 11th century, primarily over... The seventh day sabbath right so these peoples down through history the jews the serb the the african all of these people with a rich a rich heritage just incredible a rich heritage the papacy looks upon them as their enemy and their attempts to destroy them knows no limits no limits wow well i appreciate you joining us today that's going to do it for our time i'm cody mori and you've been listening to truth triumphant radio god bless and we'll catch you next time